Welcome to The Mushroom's Apprentice. My guest today is the esteemed mage and celestial priest, Christopher Warnock, who will be discussing astrological talismans. And before I introduce him, I want to begin with a quote by Paracelsus from Claude Le Couteau's text, The Book of Grimoires. Quote, they too, the signs, characters, and letters have their strength and efficacy. If the nature and distinctive essence of metals, the influence and power of heaven and the planets, the meaning and arrangement of the characters, signs, and letters harmonize and simultaneously correspond with the observation of the days, time, and hours, what then, in heaven's name, could prevent a sign or seal manufactured this way from possessing its force and ability to work? End quote. Well, Christopher Warnock has been a traditional astrologer and Renaissance astrological magician since 1998. He has been called the father of the traditional astrological magic revival and the elder statesman of astrological magic. With John Michael Greer, Mr. Warnock translated the Latin Picatrix, the most important grimoire of traditional astrological magic, and has written and published many books on astrological magic and traditional astrology. Mr. Warnock also teaches astrology and magic courses and offers authentic astrological talismans. He follows the spiritual path of Hermeticism, a practical path to Gnosis, based on the writings traditionally attributed to Hermes Trismegistus, as well as working with the Renaissance ceremonial magic of Cornelius Agrippa, Marsilio Ficino, and Picatrix. He is working towards using astrological magic theurgically as a practice that leads to spiritual Gnosis as a celestial priest. He is the steward of the Society of Astrologers, the International Association of Traditional Astrologers. His website is renaissanceastrology.com. Welcome, Christopher. Oh, I'm glad to be here. I am so happy to have you. This is a great honor. So what I'd like to do first, because I'm always so fascinated by the backstory, is just hear about what led you to this path that you're on. You know, it's funny because, um, you know, I, I, when I was, I was just thinking about this. So when I was a kid, I had two things. I wanted to speak up for the oppressed, like Clarence Darrow, and I wanted to be a wizard. So I knew from a very early age, you know, kind of what the, the broad outlines of what I wanted to do. Um, you know, I, um, I think that, you know, as I was in my kind of like in high school, I just was all caught up with whatever the conventional stuff. And then I went um, uh, to college first in the United States. And then um, I started with a junior year abroad at University of St. Andrews. And then I uh, ended up staying there and graduating. And I actually specialized in Renaissance history. Um, and then I went to law school at the University of Michigan. And um, they kind of tracked you to either be in a big law firm in Washington, D.C. or New York. So I just kind of followed the flow and ended up in, in Washington, D.C. And sort of spontaneously in Washington, D.C., I started to become a spiritual seeker. And so a spiritual seeker is kind of there's this we have this incredible sort of smorgasbord of possibilities that we can follow. And so I started sampling all sorts of different things. Um, and one of the first things I started with was uh, Sufism. There was a, a, a Iranian Sufi order uh, in uh, Washington, D.C. that had a meeting place, and I started attending that. So that was probably my first, you know, really sort of deep dive, and I was initiated as a, as a, as a Sufi. And, um, and that was kind of the first step on the spiritual path. Now, at the same time, I started just looking at a lot of different stuff, and I, I was, had noticed, a, you know, astrology books in the bookstore or whatever, and sort of looked at sort of modern astrology. And it just, it was interesting, but it just didn't seem to have the quite the depth that I was interested in. And it, it just, I just, for some reason, instinctively didn't get to, I mean, I read a couple books, but never got, did much with it. Then I stumbled on to, there's various names for it, but basically what now I call um, medieval Renaissance astrology, which is European astrology of the Middle Ages and Renaissance, and then Hori astrology. And Hori astrology is, instead of looking at someone's birth chart, you look at the chart of a question. So if you have a significant and important question, you ask an astrologer and then they note down the time that they receive the question and then look at that chart. Um, and then, so that's what I started studying. 
um, you know, it's basically by correspondence. Uh, Lee Lehman was my teacher. And so then sort of the sister of horary astrology is what's called electional astrology. And electional astrology is choosing times to take action. So you want to find an astrologic auspicious time to say get married or start a business or something like that. So a chart that would give you a yes answer to a horary, someone said, should I get married? And you got a yes. That same chart would also be a good chart, an electional chart. It had positive factors. If it was a no, it would be, have too many negative factors to be a good chart. So like I said, they're kind of a mirror of each other. So I started getting interested in electional astrology, and then astrological magic was sort of the next step. Because in order to make a talisman, you, an astrological talisman, you have to do it at an astrologically appropriate time. So that's you know one of the the key factors. So this was you know 1990, 1989, something like that. And at that point, the people that were doing the you know what do you call it? again, it's very confusing because. We used to, you know, there was various names like traditional astrology, which was pretty much used for the horary astrology. And then other people came in and said, oh, we have to, the Hellenistic astrology is traditional. So, and then it kind of, you know, there was a big shouting match and everything. And that's been kind of hijacked as a name. So it's a little, the nomenclature is a little confusing. Um, but the medieval Renaissance stuff, nobody who, who they were, people were doing horary and natal astrology. Um, Robert Zoller was, um, the one who's doing the medieval natal astrology using Guido Bonatti. Um, and then there was Hori astrology uh, using L Lillian Lilly, who was a 17th century uh, English astrologer. Um, and But nobody wanted to do astrological magic because the magic was a little kind of too out there. Um, and so I thought, well, I just want to go. I, I just was really taken with it and started actually looking at the sources. Um, and there's a good number of of traditional sources on astrological magic, Cornelius Agrippa, which you mentioned, three book of occult, three books of occult philosophy, Marsilio Ficino's three books on life, and really the premier sources was called was Picatrix, which was written in about a thousand A.D. in Arabic and then translated into Latin uh, in twelve fifty six at the court of Alfonso the Wise of Castile, and so that Picatrix really became the sort of bible of astrological magic for making talismans. Um, but what I did was to take a look at those sources. And then they don't give complete information, at least from our modern standpoint. They kind of, they're either too advanced or they're leaving pieces out or they, you already know how to do it. So since I've been trained in traditional astrology, I could take a look at that and kind of fill in the blanks. So basically what I did was two things early on, which is to try to get Picatrix translated, which I did with John Greer. But um, Basically, then the deeper thing is to set up a framework. So understand how to take those traditional sources and how to work with them. Um, because one of the problems that people have now is they'll either kind of make it up as they go along, which is what I might call the new age approach without being too pejorative about it, just kind of make it up and throw it together um, without too much knowledge of the underlying you know, essence or principles. Or I, I guess the I have to think of another term other than source, I call the source fascist, maybe source, I don't know what to say, obsessive compulsive. But anyhow, what they'll do is they'll look at the source and if it says you do X, Y, and Z, you have to do X, Y, and Z. And if you ask them why, they say, because it's in the book. So you know it's absolutely inflexible. So for example, if the talisman, they say, make this talisman in a white crystal, then you have to make it in a white crystal. And you couldn't make it in a blue crystal and you couldn't make it out of bronze and you couldn't make it out of paper. You have to make it in a white crystal and say, why? Because the book says so. So it's a very circular sort of approach. So what I try to do is to look at it and see the essence of it and to try to understand. Now, this is very much like what I do as an attorney. Because again, as an attorney, I once had a a friend of mine say, well, it's easy to be an attorney, just look up the rule in a book. And it's like, it's not because so many of the situations do not fit the rules. And so what do you do in a situation? I mean, judges spend most of their time trying to figure out a situation that's new or trying to figure out a situation that doesn't fit exactly in the rules or deciding that the rules perhaps need to be changed I mean, it's much more complex. So that's really what you need to do is to look at the essence of what the purpose of it is and to see, to understand how that. So that's the, the, that's sort of the, the, the things, you know, in that bio, they're talking about the father of being the father of the astrological magic revival. What I did first was to say, let's actually make talismans, which no one was doing. And then what I did was to help translate Picatrix, which is the main source. But the most important thing is to provide a framework for looking at how to look at those sources and how to use those sources in a practical way. Because a lot of what, what happens on social media is people will come in and they'll say, oh, these are the 50 things you have to do. 
and and they'll just be armchair and say, well, you don't have those 50 things in the election. Well, if you insist on having 50 factors, you can never make the you can never make it. On the other hand, if you just do nothing or you have one factor, then it's very weak. So you have to have a compromise between practicality and um, you know trying to fulfill all the, the the potentially possible astrological factors that you might be able to do. So that's part of it too. And there's lots of different ways of doing it. I mean, that's what all the thing I would say finally is that my method is simply my method, you know, and there's there's all there was many different ways of doing it. So there's not a right way or a wrong way. What you want to do is to understand what your own perspective is and what your own influences are and then not reject everybody else's stuff merely because it's just different than your own. And by astrological factors, could you explain what that means? Obviously, when you're doing an election, you're you're birthing the talisman essentially, right? At the proper time for the purpose of that talisman, yes? Um, yes. I mean, astrology, you know, again, is um, a methodology, really a, what I would say orientation. So orienting yourself to these various heavenly cycles. And again, this gets into some other issues too, because the how it, how does it work? I mean, this is one thing that people don't, I mean, sometimes people ask that. I mean, that's, I think it's almost considered sort of a naive question. I think if you talk to the average astrologer or esotericist, it's not something they want to really grapple with. Mm -hmm. And so the typical causality is going to be, I mean, the I'm going to say a little bit about worldview. It's extremely important to understand what your worldview is. And a worldview is not just our conscious philosophy, but it's our unconscious assumptions about how things work. And what, basically, it's your reality. And so the tendency is to see reality as, well, obviously, it's objectively true. There's only one reality. If you disagree with reality, then you're insane. And not recognize that it's possible to have different worldviews. And so worldview is really not a matter of choice. It's something that really basically is presented to us by our society and by the, the time that we're in. Um, and so really, you could say that we are a manifestation of worldview, that each of us in the modern era is a manifestation of the modern worldview. The other thing I would say about it, worldview is that it, it's a lot like gravitation. And so the modern worldview is like a like a planet or a black hole. It, it casts a gravitational pull over everybody, every modern person, which is not to say that there's not other influences. So, so basically, the modern worldview is that nothing exists except matter and energy. And so when you say spiritual, then that's psychological. When you say psychological, that means it's a brain function. And the brain is a physical thing. It has, it has electrochemical impulses in it. And then you can break that down to um, atoms and molecules, which you can break down to subatomic particles. So everything that takes place is the result of the interaction of these subatomic particles according to physical laws or to chance. And that is the ultimate nature of reality. And so... And that's pretty much the, it is the underlying base that everyone's working from. So there's a lot of people, and again, I hate to say new age again, but they're doing magic and astrology, which are quote spiritual, but their underlying view of reality or their unconscious view of reality is matter and energy. So typically, if you're going to look at astrology and magic and how it works, the normal response as far as how it works is uh, beams or rays, some sort of energy. And there are a lot of people out there that think it's magnetism, that think it's scientific energy, which it's not. There's no detectable scientific energy uh, for, it's not gravitation, it's not sun, you know, sunspots or string theory, anything like that. But so what people will say is that a little more sophisticated will say, well, it's, it's a spiritual energy, it's akin to physical energy, it's just not detectable. But it's an impersonal force or forces, it's beams, it's rays, that's how it works. So a natal chart, is basically conceptualized as sort of like the planets are at certain angles and they're beaming things at you. And so if it's a good beam, it causes good things. If it's a bad beam, it causes bad things. And that's basically the view of how the underlying causality of what's going on, which is, you know, in the traditional view, there is some support for that in terms of rays, but the rays are not a modern electromagnetic ray. They're basically analogized from light. And they saw light as having a level of consciousness, having a level of life and awareness. So it's really a, a, a different view, but that was one, one view of the causality of it. Um, but the spiritual is very hard for us to grasp because we're coming from a society that has no, that's instead entirely energy or mechanical. So to, to actually grasp what the spiritual is, I mean, it often just means good. 
I'm spiritual, so I'm good without any further idea of it. Or it's, like I said, it's, it's beams or rays. So that's something that's difficult to grasp. Um, one way to think about it is the underlying relationships or like that, that underpin reality. So for example, if you thought about a savanna in Africa, it has a certain biological carrying capacity. I mean, even before there's any, any life there at all, it has a certain amount of sunlight, a certain amount of water, a certain amount of nutrients. So it has the capacity to have, say, a, a, a million tons of biomass. And so of that million tons of the biomass, it could have, like I said, um, you know, 99 million, 90 million tons of, you know, of plants. And then it only has the capacity for a million tons of herbivore and then 100,000 tons of carnivore. And so these interrelationships, and you can't put any more on there. If you try to have more carnivores, then they would die because there wouldn't be enough for them to eat. So before there's even any life there, all this intricate web of potentialities is already present. And so, and that continually where the, with the life. And so an, an interesting example of that in terms of the life is that if you think about the, you have different ecological niches and those niches, again, pre-exist the existence of any life in them at all. They're already there and pre-existing. Um, so for example, the wolf, right? This is sort of, a, you know, 50 to 100 pound carnivore and it, it you know it's oftentimes the apex carnivore and it's in the environment it's in and it can eat various types of rodents and things like that in you know say africa or in the in in, in america in eurasia that niche is filled by wolves in australia they didn't have their had marsupial mammals so they had a, a wolf like a tasmanian wolf but it's a marsupial it looks like a wolf but it's a, appearance is like a wolf it fits the same niche but it is not at all related to it it has evolved to fit that same niche. But what's a niche? Where's the physical existence of the niche? It's not. It's spiritual. It's a relationship. It's an, it's an interpenetrated web of relationships. So that's just one. That's not to say that spiritual is that, but that's just to say just to kind of give a pointer in terms of understanding how the spiritual underlies the material and the spiritual patterns the material and the material exists dependent on the spiritual without, you know, like I said, another one would be... Um, if you think about sexual reproduction, the one cell creatures, you know, they'll, they just split and they make clone, they make exact duplicates of themselves. But at some point they're evolved the capability to move some of this genetic, genetic material over to another cell. And then you have, you have, you know, you have a much more mixing of, you know, instead of having exact duplicates, you have an opportunity to have all sorts of mixing of the, the genes. It's, it's much more evolutionary, lots more possibilities, but right there you have, you have sexual reproduction. You have fathers. You have fathers and sons. You have mothers and daughters. And so I can see a father, and I can see a son, but I can't see fatherhood. But that inherent relationship is always present whenever you have sexual reproduction. So that's another way to think of the Platonic ideas, not as being some ghostly thing in another physical place, but being the underlying inherent patterning that of reality. And you can glimpse it whether that physically exists or not. You know at, at it sounds like an underlying master intelligence. I mean, that's obviously a master intelligence. That that then well, again, this is this is this is what I would say is that certainly in the in the methodology and the philosophy and the worldview that I'm operating in, which is heavily Buddhist, you know, that consciousness is an inherent quality of the ground of being, and therefore. Yes, I would say that intelligence. See, the, the how it expresses itself, though, depends on the situation and the matter. I mean, the intelligence of a rock is a, is a rock intelligence, whereas the intelligence of a bee is a bee intelligence. I mean, it's expressing itself through the, the manif the, those manifestations at that point. But yes, I mean, I remember reading this book about, it's talking about, this is by a scientist, you know, it's talking about the evolution of pines. And, in, and pine trees evolved before the angiosperms, the flowering plants. And the flowering plants had a lot of advantages in an evolutionary way. So they kind of outcompeted them. So he's saying, well, the pine trees decided they would go up on the mountains and go into areas with lots of forest fires. And they adapted themselves to that. And so I'm really thinking it was a collective. I mean, there's a, an intelligence operating at the level of pine tree, you know, as, a, as an entity. And now if you challenge the, the scientists on that, they would say, oh, no, that's not true. It's just it's random evolution. But, you know, it is a, a useful model for conceptualizing how you think about things. But again, in the Buddhist view, we don't exist as individuals anyway. 
So, you know, but you can certainly react to somebody as a person, as a useful model. So that's what I would say about my general approach within the magical and astrological view is much more in terms of personalities. So if I'm in interacting with Mars, it's as a personality, as a person, as a, basically as an angel. So that's, but, but to say that that's an underlying, that's reality, it's, it's a model. It's, it's useful as far as it works, but then everything we do is modeling. So, you know, it's, it's um, but yes, I mean, I, my sense of it is that there is an intelligence, but look at COVID. I mean, that's another, there seemed to be an intelligence operating with COVID. I mean, it was quickly, every time they came up with a new vaccine, they were quickly, it was quickly coming up with a way around the new vaccine. It was mutating like crazy. It seemed like it was very intelligent, you know, um, all the cell, even if it's separate, you know, but the cells in our body, they, you know, they, they collectively are operating together. I mean, what's, is there a difference between COVID that's spatially separated and our human body with cells that are connected? I mean, again, these are all sort of levels of, of um, you know, there's similarity and difference. So mm -hmm. a lot of it is that if you open up your thinking to these possibilities, then you start seeing these patternings. And so insofar as you can practically make use of it, you know, that's the test. You know, if you, if you say, I see this out there and can I actually make use of it, you know, or a cause a reaction or something like that, then that's what I think that's, that's probably the, 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 uh, the test. So, so as you can see, there's a lot to this in terms of before you get to the talismans, because like, if you don't know how they work, then, you know, or if you have a particular idea, like, for example, if you think of a talisman as razor energy is the cause, then you think of the talisman as a battery. So mm -hmm. it's this, this, and the magic comes from the talisman. So when people talk to me, they're often saying, well, do I have to, there's this thing out there that you have to wear 24 hours a day and you have to wear next to your skin. And I'm not sure that part of it's just that everyone knows that. It's only one of those internet things that everybody knows that just gets endlessly duplicated. But the, I think the logic behind it is it's got energy and you charge it up like a battery and it's radiating energy. So you obviously wouldn't want to have it with you because otherwise you wouldn't have the energy rated at, radiated at you. So mm -hmm. I think that's the logic of it. Whereas, which I don't think is wrong, but I mean, my approach is that the talisman is more like having the cell phone of the angel. And so that allows you to have a very quick connection to them. And then the purpose of the talisman is to form, to help you to form that relationship. So in other words, that's what I'm typically doing with the, 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 the talismans that I have as a means of contacting and forming a relationship with the, these angelic beings. And, um, and I'll reconsecrate it, like do the light, the candle and do the incense or whatever. And so fumigating is traditionally, you move it through the, the incense as a means of, it's like a friend. I mean, you, you want to contact them, you call up, hang out with them and you form a relationship. So that's, but that's only one model. I mean, there's other, there's plenty of other approaches to it, but that's the one I was drawn to. What I, I call that a devotional approach. It's very much like the Catholic church with a saint or an angel, you know, so it's a very similar sort of approach, very, it's, and it's a personal relationship. So. Well, speaking of which, could you give us a little history of talismans? Cause this is very, very old. I think that, I mean, it's there's a difference between, I mean, talk about talisman as a physical magical object. There's a ton of that sort of thing going on. Astrological talismans, um, you know, the magical practice, you know, and again, how people conceptualized what a talisman was, say, for the, um, I mean, there's a lot of magical stuff. I mean, every society has magic. And so the talisman is basically, here's the other thing is that, the tendency is to think of a talisman as a pendant or maybe a ring, and that's a talisman. Right. But in the medieval Renaissance tradition, anything that is made at a particular time astrologically and consecrated can be considered to be a talisman. So, for example, you can have you think of Excalibur. You know, I was doing mirrors. You know, a magic mirror, mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest of them all? Sort of magical stuff. But you know, um, buildings. Uh, there's an entire city. Astrological Magic City described in, in Picatrix. Um, you know, I've worked with artists who did, you know, paintings and things like that. I mean, there's, there's a really wide variety of things that you can. Now, you're constrained somewhat by the fact that the typical time frame for that all the factors are in place would be maybe, say, half an hour to an hour. So if you're going to make a talisman, it needs to be something that has a process that can be done very quickly. Because otherwise, stamping, casting metal. Um, I was, I was acid etching mirrors, 
Um, you could do Sculpey. I mean, a lot of things like, but the, the, the standard engraving takes a couple hours, so that wouldn't work very well. So this is one of those things of like, in, in order to, to fit that in there. But I mean, astrological talismans, um, you know, there's there's record of astrological magic insofar as using, say, like, for example, the moon phases, the waxing away in the moon or the signs of the moon in the Greek magical papyri, which are like, you know, classical period. Um, astrological magic, um, the full astrological magic, full chart election, multi-factor elections, you know, basically looks like um, probably early medieval was when that, and that's Picatrix. The Haranian Sabians, Haran is a city in basically what had been northern Syria, or it's now in Turkey, it's in Mesopotamia, um, was a real source for a lot of, of the philosophy and you know magic and science you know they were there was all mixed together though there wasn't a differentiation between science and magic um but astronomy astrology magical texts things like that and they may be the ones who invented it they're the one the first that we have in of notice of it and so that would be like seven eight hundred a.d and so uh and we haven't surpassed that i mean picatrix is as the the basically the height of astrological magic in terms of the of the, that but um so um picatrix was translated in, into latin like i said in 1256 and it circulated in a manuscript in europe so you had to be able to read latin to, in order to do it but you'd also need a lot of math i mean to do the astrology you had to do it by hand so you had to do all the calculations so it really took somebody who really a lot of sort of monks and clerics had that capability it was never that popular because it, the, it, the skill set was just too difficult to do but there was significant numbers of people, and William Lilly, again, who's 17th century, talks about sending a a, a whole um, trunk full of talismans to Elias Ashmole, who was a, also an esotericist. Um, and, you know, like I said, this would be like in 1650s, things like that. So there was plenty of people making them. Um, but um, the, um, you know, that's, but, you know, it died out because, first of all, the, the over you know, come about 1700 with the, with the quote enlightenment. Again, the view there was that again, everything was made of matter and energy. And so one of the primary focuses of the quote enlightenment and the like singular Royal society and the early scientists was to stamp out what they called superstition, which is to stamp out any idea of spiritual anything basically. So, and we still have that to this day. I mean, if you, you know, I've seen like the national science foundation has a thing on astrology and it's calls it a pseudoscience and, you know, and basically it's no scientific evidence, but the, the bottom line is that it, it can't work because it's spiritually based and there's no such spirituals doesn't exist. And, um, but you know, there's what I call the truce, which is that again, about, you know, in 1700 with the enlightenment, essentially the, the scientists and the, you know, the, the I call it is atheist materialism as what our physicalism is this view that there's nothing except matter and energy. We're allowed to um they are the ones who define the nature of reality. But if you wanted to be religious, you could do it on Sunday and be irrational. So you could you could go into church and you know talk about God, but then when you back to work on Monday, you would back to recognize that of course there's none of that stuff really exists. So that's kind of the state that we're in is sort of a schizophrenia. So that if you push people and I learned that as a child, not to ask people about religion because they could not explain it and they would just get upset if you asked them questions about it. Um, and that was one of the things that I, was important to me. And what I liked about traditional uh, astrology or magic or philosophy was that there was not at that time a, a differentiation between science and theology. They were not in contradiction with each other. Um, and now the reality of, I mean, people say, well, science and religion are coming together. They cannot come together. It's impossible because they're antithetical. Now, most people that religious, like the fundamentalism has basically um, caved and they also think that there's nothing except matter and energy in terms of their their day-to-day -day stuff. And they have God, but then if you ask how things work, then it's, or there's miracles or something like that. I was reading a book recently about archeology span in Israel. And there's a tremendous amount of the sort of, you know, fundamentalist Christian stuff because they want to prove the Bible, which seems ridiculous to me. You know, it's like, like there's a, a, ossuary which is sort of a casket for bones and that somebody had apparently i mean there's a controversy whether it's forged or not but it said something to the effect of james brother of jesus you know so it's like this is like jesus's tomb or something and somehow if you had the physical proof of jesus that would be the highest again because there's nothing more important than matter and energy and 
but to me that just seems irrelevant you know that the the bible clearly to me was divinely inspired it had to be come through individual humans so there's but there's clearly incredibly spiritually important but so was the sutras and the Quran and everything else, you know, and that's what's important, not the physical relic itself or the manifestation, but, but looking through the essence of it. And so to me, the worrying about whether Jesus, I mean, I think Jesus did exist, but that's not the point, you know, I, I, I'll give an example of that they, they had the Shroud of Turin. Have you heard of that? Yeah. And so it's got this face of Jesus on it. And um, somebody did some scientific analysis of it, and they said, oh, it looks like it's from 1300. And I'm like, well, if it's from 1300, it's received all this devotion over that period, and it's, 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 quote, charged anyway. So, I mean, the fact that it has to be Jesus' actual thing, it's like, that doesn't particularly, you know what I mean? It's like the physical reality of it is less important than, the to me, the, the, the spiritual. I mean, that, that sort of devotion. Um, I like that pilgrimage and all sorts of things like that. I mean, I kind of think that the Reformation was a disaster in a lot of ways. Um, but you know, it's, um, you know, that's because I, it took me a long time, but I have more or less come to a spiritual worldview. And so to me, the world seems to be, everything is alive, you know, it's alive in its own way, but like trees obviously are alive, but I mean, they have a spirit, a rock is, has a spirit. Um, you know, I had a lot of, I, I the, the Zen experience I had was useful, but I, the, the Shinto, which is the, the sort of basic native religion of japan is very much has that view of the kami everything has a spirit um and so that my wife is very much naturally in that kind of viewpoint and was very helpful and kind of she's a lot of people are like that that's their sort of natural setup and that's their natural orientation so it's just sad that the society in the philosophy disavows that so you can't have somebody give you a r logical rational philosophical explanation of that you know, uh, they'll call it animism or something. It's just kind of putting it in a box and putting a label on it and being sort of pejorative. But um, there actually is, that's what one of the things I enjoy about it is to be able to say, look, I can, if you accept the existence of the spiritual, if you're willing to open to that, then all this makes sense. And it is very logical and I can give chapter and verse an explanation for it. Um, but, um, you know, that's so, um, so that's what I would say is that the the bedrock is that, the magic and astrology have a spiritual basis and then not dependent upon matter and energy, you know, and that they underlie that. And so they're really practical applications of spiritual, you know, sort of principles. And um, so astrology has essentially is looking at, um, it uses geocentric, you know, we're looking from the viewpoint of being on earth and they'll say, Oh, it's fake. Cause it's, you know, we know that the sun goes around the earth. Well, if you look up in the sky, it does look like the sun is rising in the east and setting in the west. So it is an accurate visual explanation from the standpoint of Earth. If you go out in space, it looks differently, but we're not in space. And so if you think about like, you know, before GPS, people were doing navigation, celestial navigation it was geocentric and it was perfectly accurate. Um, same thing with uh, surveying. If you're doing surveying, it's also going to be celestial and it's also going to be geocentric. So for that purpose, it's, you know, it's a bit like saying, well, when you see that stop sign, it's not really red because it's actually these, you know, magnetic, you know, the, the vision and everything and all the processes. And it's like, well, for a stop sign, it looks red. You see this red sign, you stop. So, and again, this is what I'd say about it is it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's perfectly a, a geocentric astronomy and astrology that we use is perfectly accurate from the standpoint that we're coming from, which is on earth. So we see these celestial cycles, which are very, very regular. You know, the, 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 you know, the planets are doing their sort of dance with each other and orbiting and retrograding and going forward and backwards. And so if you look at an astrological chart, it's a perfectly accurate 2D representation of the actual position of the planets from that time, date, and place. And if you took it to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory or the astronomers, they would grumblingly say yes. They couldn't really deny that. So it's perfectly accurate. What they deny is there any significance to it. Mm -hmm. Because the problem with the modern worldview is that not only is it physicalist or atheistic materialist in denying there's anything except matter and energy, but they also are nihilist. So eventually it ends up being nihilistic because everything is either these random, you know, interactions of these subatomic particles or, ch or ch again, chance or physical laws. Therefore, there's no inherent meaning to anything. So life is meaningless and you're this, you know, tiny little person trapped in this huge universe and you didn't exist and you exist for a short time that's full of pain and then you die. And that's the ultimate view of reality. 
and uh, which is perfectly accurate from the the ego self standpoint. If you identify entirely with the ego self, then that's correct. Um, so in order to find meaning, you would need to have a larger identification, you know, and um, so, um, and I think that that's you know that to me is the real tragedy of the modern era is you know you know not that people are poor you know, that people have economic problems, but that we've somehow removed their, their meaning and the reason for living. And so that's one of the things that's really helpful for me uh, with, because, you know, I've done over 5,000 horror charts, for example, for questions for clients. And I keep a record. I do it in writing to keep a record. And if you keep getting stuff, I don't always get it right. But if I keep getting it right again and again and again, and it's impossible because there is no spiritual reality, then you're like, that's a very tangible sort of uh, practical uh, recognition that in fact that the this idea that there's nihilism and that nothing fits and there's random everything isn't true that in fact the cycles of the heavens reflect the same cycles that are taking place on earth and therefore if you see the heavenly cycles which are very clear we can understand the the cycles on earth as well i mean your birth chart's the same way i mean it's just kind of amazing that the time date and place of your birth if you look at the way the planets are arranged you can tell a tremendous amount about someone's personality. And so that's an area of mine. When I do a natal reading for somebody, I do a modern style reading of the personality. I add some more techniques into it because traditional astrology is much more complex, has many more techniques than modern astrology. So it, we have some additional nuance, particularly in the negatives, because traditional astrology is predictive. So it has to have a way of mapping everything from the most positive things to neutral to the most negative. So I can look at, at a chart and I can do that careful calibration of the positive and negative. Whereas modern astrology, since it comes from a psychological standpoint, if you go to a psychologist, they're not going to be negative with you. They're going to want to talk to you, listen to you, be sympathetic. And help, even though they can only help, I mean, um, uh, I'm blanking on his name, um, famous psychologist, um, he, he said, you know, only a, th a third of people recover. He said a third of people don't, aren't hurt by it. And, you know, a third of, you know, but you'd only have about a third recovery from, you know, from, from your typical therapy. Um, and so, but you don't say that to your patients, you give everybody an opportunity and you want to be upbeat and positive. And that upbeat, positive nature is reflected in modern astrology with a few exceptions. They've imported a few things like Vorticorce Moon or retrograde, particularly Mercury, but all, all retrogrades now. And those have to take all the weight of negativity. So while in traditional astrology, Void of Course Moon is really not that big a deal. It's a minor affliction. It's, you know, apocalyptic in modern astrology because there's just not anything else negative. So all the negativity kind of has to focus on either retrogrades or the, or the Void of Course Moon. The other problem with astro modern astrology is that, another, another, among the problems, is that for the most part, ostensibly astrology is for predictive purposes. But for mostly it's used for reassurance or for a false sense of control. And so the skeptics, you know, I, I certainly, you know, I don't believe that astrology works any more than I believe that atoms exist. I mean, they, it makes sense to me. It's not a belief system. It's, it's that it makes sense within the thing. But my view is astrology works. But nevertheless, there's a lot of people using it not for predictive purposes. And so... Um, Again, you like the retrograde Mercury stuff. That's a, a people. Many people have heard of that, you know. And so people will say, "Oh, that was retrograde Mercury." Well, they can't predict it in advance what's going to happen. They don't know what's going to happen when Mercury's retrograde, and, and if something does happen, they, they can't connect it to Mercury necessarily. They can only do it after the fact. So if you can't predict it in advance, and you don't understand what's going on, you know, you can look at any chart and pull anything out of it. You know, if you know what the outcome is, you can find something that will fit that outcome. But that's not prediction. So. That's an unfortunate, or like I said, false sense of control. It's like, oh, if something bad happens. Well, at least I know what it, had. it was Mercury retrograde. Well, not really, but you feel better, but that you, that you at least have some idea of what's going on. So a lot of the, what's what people are doing, or they're looking at Hitler's chart or Einstein's chart. Oh, we can see why Normandy, whatever, because I can see Hitler's chart. Well, you already knew the outcome. So I did an example of that once. I on my my group, I posted this chart. It had Scorpio rising, and had a lot of plants in the eighth house, which is would be considered to be negative. And I said, oh, this is a famous serial killer. People say, oh, yeah, it's a famous serial killer. I said, oops, actually, it's Gandhi. And so, you know, again, depending if you know who the person's chart is, you can, again, make it fit whoever you want. And so in my natal astrology course, we don't do any celebrities and you don't do your own chart. What you get is a bunch of charts of people you don't even know, and then you have to predict based just on the chart. And so that's real astrology. That's real predictive astrology. 
And, um, you know, I think that that's, um, you know, because my focus is, you know, again, it's, it's, it's on actual prediction. And so again, what I'm doing is I'm going to give a written prediction in advance and you could do with anything. If you're a psychic, you make a written prediction in advance. And then when you get the results, you check back to see how close you're, you're fit. Cause if you're making predictions and you're not writing it down, it's very easy to fool yourself with that as well. And also people don't want to follow up on it. So a lot of times, again, I mean, I get people asking me like a hoary question, when will I get a job? And they're not asking me, they want to know they're worried and they want me to make them feel better. And my job, what I'm getting paid to do is to make them feel better. So I'll say back to people, I say, well, is it going to help you if I say you're not going to get a job? And a lot of people will be upset with that or they say, oh, well, that would make it worse. Now, some people think, no, that's useful information. I can, I can do it. But um, I mean, with horror astrology, you get a lot of no's. I mean, people don't ask questions when everything's going great. They're usually asking a question when things are, they're having problems. So it's not too surprising that things don't come back. And lots, I mean, how often do things you want to have plans they don't work out? I mean, that's frequent, like relationships. I mean, I get a lot of relationship questions. I mean, every single relationship doesn't work out, even if you'd like it to work out. So, I mean, that's, and I, I'm not, I'm guilty of that myself. I mean, I do I Ching readings. You know, I'll do like a daily one. What's the current situation? And I certainly would like to get a positive, but, you know, I, I accept that I won't, I don't always. And I'm like, okay, I'm just going to roll with it. Um, and um, I want today, my business has slowed down a certain amount. And I asked and I got the f uh, hexagram four, which often the I Ching will give to you if you keep asking the too many, the same question too often. So it's like, I'm like, which I try not to do. I try to respect the Oracle. And uh, for example, I don't ask a question then ignore what it says. I don't ask the question multiple times until I get the answer I want. You know what I mean? You respect, you respect the Oracle. And that's what astrology is, is an Oracle. I mean, What's different about astrology, the predictive astrology is that, like the traditional astrology is that you have a tremendous amount of technique. So you can get a lot of information from the chart itself, um, but you still have to use intuition in your interpretation. So for example, if someone asked me, will I marry X or have a committed relationship with X? You would look at the first house to represent the person asking the question and look at the planet ruling that house to look at the, the, where that person was, what state they were in. You look at the seventh house for relationships and the ruler of the seventh to look at the person you're asking about. So for example, if the, the planet ruling the seventh house was afflicted, that would be an indication that the person is unable, unwilling, or unsuitable for the relationship. Now, which of those three it is, you need to look at the rest of the chart, but also use your intuition in terms of your judgment, in terms of that. Uh, guy, Because the intuition is the ability, that patterning ability, you know, the ability to see the underlying, you know, like if you're like a paleontologist, you get the little bone, you can see the whole rest of the dinosaur. And that's something you can work at and learn. I mean, some people don't have it. Other people have it naturally, but something you can definitely, I've, you know, you work at it a lot. The, the, what's useful about the traditional astrology is you have a lot of information to start with and you don't use your intuition to overthrow the chart. If I'm coming in with someone's afflicted seventh house, you know, afflicted plan, and ruler of the seventh, I'm not going to be saying, oh, well, I'm getting these vibe that you're going to have a great relationship. You're just not going to be coming up that way in terms of the chart. Now, in terms of charts, uh, with regard to talismans, you highly recommend before someone purchase an astrological talisman, you, you need to have a look at their chart or you should have a look at their chart, right? Because it's useful. I think of people, again, people get really, there's a lot of fear in this area. There's a tremendous amount of superstition and fear. People are scared to death. I had a guy the other day, he was, had, he got Venus, a Venus talisman, and he was doing a consecration of it. And he was, what he was doing was rather than doing stick incense, he was doing like a resin incense. In order to do burn that, you have to get charcoal. Now there's this sort of standard cheap charcoal that you get online or from a store that comes in a foil package and it's round, right? And it it's terrible because when you light it, it's hard to light it and it pops, pop, 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 and it goes out. And so he's like, he said, I got this charcoal it kept popping and it's a bad omen, isn't it? And I'm, should I stop? Should I, you know, Venus is cursing me. And I just said, I said, dude, I said, that's the way that charcoal works. I said, use Japanese charcoal. I said, that works better, you know, but that's what I'm saying. That's what people are bringing to this. And he was, but he was scared, you know, obviously the demons uh, uh, were coming after him or something like that. So, I mean, that's one of the things I say to people. I said, you know, really with my talismans, you know, I don't know about anybody else's, but mine, I'm only working with angels. It's as positive, benefic magic as I can get. And really the worst you're going to get for the most part is nothing happens. 
And that's always a possibility, too, because people say, what's going to happen? I said, it could be nothing. You know, it's you have to take a leap in the dark with it. And if you're expecting a specific result, you know, you're it's often going to be, you know, like particularly love tales. I want this person to come back to me. That's probably not going to happen. If you're saying I like love, then that's a, a broader thing. But you're still trying to influence the outside world to conform to your. If you're saying I would like to be transformed to be a more loving person, that's doable. You know, mm -hmm. that's something that's and that's pretty effective. If you become a more loving person, then you're naturally going to have this a much better way to have a relationship. So that's what I would say is that a lot of it is and 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 but not to downplay the because you can have miraculous effects with it, but it's unpredictable. If I could guarantee you win the lottery, I would sell it for a million dollars. I mean, that's the thing about talents. But people do have all these incredible results, but you can't expect to have, you know, again, it's not Harry Potter. It's not technology. It's not lightning bolts coming out of your fingertips. It's not thousand and one nights. It's real. And because it's real, it has to operate in the real world. So it can be instantaneously powerful, you know. And the work that you do makes it makes a difference too. I mean, that's there's a lot of it's like like um, you know if you heard that oh you know Tiger Woods won the U.S. Open with these golf clubs, so I, I'm gonna I want to win a million dollars too. I'll just buy these golf clubs, and you don't win the Open. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the golf clubs. I mean, Tiger Woods couldn't win the Open without golf clubs, but there's a lot more that goes into it than just buying the golf clubs. And so that's the tenant again. That's the technology. With an iPad, you just buy the iPad. With a you know a, a watch, you just buy it. It does it automatically for you. It's technology, but these are not technology. You know, there's so, a, there's an interaction. There's and 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 so that's what I would say about it is like I don't really like try to keep my prices reasonable. I'm not if you charge five thousand dollars, I think you're making an implicit promise about what's going to happen with the talisman. And so that, I really try to keep the prices down. Um, and um, you know, that's one of the reasons I'd like to make it available to people. You know, but I also don't want to be making a. I think if it's three or four hundred dollars, which is what I typically charge, I don't think that's as much of a promise of the miraculous effects as a three thousand dollar talisman. Right, but you are you're following the guidelines of the Picatrix, which is a very very important book on. Yeah, I mean, you could do it in a different way mm -hmm. than what I do, and even if you followed it exactly, you wouldn't necessarily guarantee because that's what people say. They say. Well, did you do all 50 things? And they say, no, oh, well, that's why it didn't work. I'm like, that's not why it didn't work. It's because no one, you couldn't follow 50 things that still wouldn't work. You know what I mean? That's not the, the people will do that too. They'll be like, I bought this, I got this son Aries talisman and this happened. And I got the son Leo talisman and that happened. And that means now we know the difference son Aries and son Leo. I'm like, you're crazy because it's totally subjective. It's anecdotal, you know, I mean, I had somebody, this is a long time ago, they, they bought a Jupiter talisman. And they said, oh, three weeks later, my mother fell down the stairs, so I threw the talisman away. I'm like, what are you talking about? Again, that's superstition. And so, I mean, I, I'll give you an example. Algol, a very powerful protective talisman. I had this happen, and I've had, I don't know, at least 100 people report this to me, that they had electrical or electronic interference when they first got it. And that's very typical. Now, plenty of people don't. Right. But someone like me easily said, yeah, my whole block lost power that when it was delivered. So so that it happens enough and it, it's logical within that particular type of talisman because it's very powerful talisman, protection talisman that, yes, I think that that's we can say that that's a typical effect, not for everybody, but typical. But, oh, I did it once and this happened. How do you even know that was caused? Because other people say, oh, I got this talisman, something bad happened. I'm like, how do we know the talisman caused it either for good or for ill? You know, that's what I would say about it is that so much fear, you know, or credulousness. And that's one of the things I like to bring to it. But yes, I like to follow the traditional stuff, you know, as, and at the same time, what I'm doing is Picatrix. That's what people say. Well, Picatrix says this. I said, Picatrix says a lot of stuff. I mean, Picatrix is a compilation. It was compiled from over 200 books and they didn't, no one went through it and like tried to, there's a lot of contradictions. I mean, for example, there's one section that says, this is just having to do with elections, of choosing when to do things like marriage or something. Don't have the moon in the ascendant because the moon is very fast moving and it causes things not to last very long. Okay. And then I have moon talismans. And the moon talisman section says, make the talisman with the moon rising. Well, of course that makes sense because it's the most the most powerful position, either rising or at the midheaven, directly over on the horizon or directly overhead. But some say, oh, you can't do those are bad talismans because this other section of Picatrix says don't make it when the moon is ascendant. I said, well, I mean, they don't, it doesn't fit together. I mean, it's contradictory. And to look for some objective, 100% true for all time, 
it's just not going to make sense. It's I, I'd like to look at Picatrix in sort of modular sense. I said, if you look at the sections of it, they tend to focus on a set of, like, for example, there's a section on moon signs. So you put the moon in a sign that's appropriate for the activity. You have the moon rising or culminating and I think waxing or waning. And those are three factors. That's about as much as you can get in an election. And that makes sense. But you don't try to put that into then the Jupiter talisman. Oh, Jupiter, what about the moon? I mean, blah, I mean, you'd have, again, you'd have 50. If you tried to follow everything in pictures, you'd have 50 factors in an election and you could never get it to work. So right. just how do you sort through that stuff is what I spent a lot of. And that's the advanced part of my astrological magic course is actually looking at these texts. And sometimes they won't have enough information. Sometimes there won't be enough in there. Other times there'll be too much. So mm -hmm. it's... um. Like I said, it's a very close analogy to law, because if you're a five-year-old, it's enough to know, don't follow the rules or you're going to get in trouble. And you don't go into the deeper meaning of it. You were told to do this, you do it, you follow it. And if you don't follow it, you're going to get in trouble. But that doesn't work for the person, the judge or the legislator can't have that attitude, you know, and or, or a lawyer. Like I said, as an advanced practitioner, you cannot have that act attitude about it because otherwise well i mean people do i mean i mean the perfect example is this and this is also the materialist stuff there's there's a standard listing of metals that appropriate go with the planets now that's only one of maybe 20 different listings i mean they're all over the place in terms of the, the traditional sources but the standard listing of metals is saturn for lead is lead jupiter is tin mars is iron sun is gold venus is copper mercury is liquid mercury and um, the, the Mars is silver, okay? And so people are like, why aren't you making your talismans out of lead? And Saturn talismans. And I was like, well, it's not a very good material. It's poisonous, and it's also saw. Like, the book says so. But the reason they really follow it, like I said, the Greater Key of Solomon, for example, has that listing in it. So people are like, why aren't your pentacles from the Greater Key of Solomon done that way? And they're like, if, you, if I try to explain everything, they're like, well, you're not following the book. You're an idiot. So they just, but they don't follow the ritual. There's this incredibly elaborate ritual, and nobody worries about that. But the materials really, because the talisman is the source of the magic, and matter is the source of all truth and power, comes from material objects. So they have to follow. Same thing with the whole sidereal zodiac thing. That's another one. So the zodiac that we use, zodiac is basically a 360 degree circle. It allows us to very precisely show the positioning of anything. So if you want to have an astrology, whether it's Chinese astrology or Vedic astrology or the Western and Arabic astrology that we use, they always have a zodiac because it allows you to precisely indicate, instead of saying, you say, you know, uh, you know, seven Taurus, that's equivalent to saying 37 degrees of the 360 degree circle. So that's basically what it is. The tropical zodiac is oriented to the seasons. So the, on the first day of spring is when the sun enters Aries. And that's also the, the equal, equinox when the days are equal, the day and the night are equal. The sun goes into cancer at the summer solstice, which is the time in the, in the northern hemisphere when the sun quits, stops moving f to the north and stands still. And then it's also the longest day of the year. And then the fall, and, and the enter Libra in the fall, which is the autumnal equinox. Again, the days are equal. And, um, and then you have the winter solstice, which is when the, when the sun enters Capricorn. Very natural, very logical, makes a lot of sense. This is what everyone's been using for 2,000 years. However, it doesn't correspond to the physical constellations. And since the physical constellations have to be the source of astrology, because what else could be? Because nothing exists except matter and energy. It must be the physical stars. and doesn't correspond to the physical stars. Then we just toss out the tropical zodiac. Now, the sidereal zodiac is what they use in Vedic astrology. It, it is not corresponding to the physical stars. It doesn't, it just, it has a, a fixed point with a fixed star fixed point as opposed to the seasons. Otherwise it has 12 signs of 30 degrees each. It doesn't correspond, but people don't know that, but they do know that all the idiots in the past, you know, they're idiots in the past. So we're going to throw it. It's like, you know, they all thought the earth was flat. Not true. That was, that's, was invented in the 19th century to make us all feel superior. Any educated person since about 300 BC knew that the world was round. Because it's it's obviously round, so a lot it's of just one of those think things. Like flat today, Chris. well, then they again don't under not educated people. Like I said, this is sort of like that's just a modern problem. But so that's what I would say about it is that you know there's a lot of the sort of physicalism and everything that that permeates people's thinking, yes. and that you always are going to be putting your foot wrong until you get your your philosoph philosophical and worldview in line with your practices. So if you're doing magic 
and yet you think the world is only matter and energy, you're going to have all sorts of these things coming up. But I get hassled all the time about the tropical zodiac. To me, it's like arguing about whether the metric system versus inches. I mean, it's a measuring system, you know, mm -hmm. and you can do perfectly well with sidereal zodiac if you're doing Vedic astrology. But it's a lot like, you know, for example, if I'm, I'm a, you know, playing Bach and I'm trying to be a, in a, in a um, you know, Baroque orchestra and use a harpist chord and all that. And someone come in and said, oh, well, the ragas, they use these quarter tone scale. I'm like, that's fine. Go ahead and use it. But you're not going to be doing, you know, we don't change it around. Right. And if you want to change a sidereal, you can in modern. Modern, you can mix and match. The basics, one of the things about modern astrology is you can use any technique from any type of school of astrology. You just, it's because it, the view is it's so like Tinker Toys. You can just take it out and it works by itself and you can just stick it together with everything else and create your own thing. It's like everybody else has created own thing, but it's, that's, the, which is fine. That's, that's how modern works. But if you're going to do traditional, you're going to do the medieval Renaissance, we have a methodology that we use and we don't mess around with it. Like I said, ballet, why aren't you wearing, you know, tennis shoes? Why are you wearing point shoes? Because that's what we do. Well, that's wrong. We're going to throw that out. Well, you're not doing ballet anymore. It's fine to, 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 that's modern dance, you know? So that's what I would say about it is that, again, this idea of astrology, there's no astrology. There's various schools. And if someone says they do astrology, then it means they do modern astrology because that's what people have heard of. And there's, again, nothing wrong with it. I do. I have, I like it. I think it's great for psychological stuff, but it's important to understand where you come from. And because if you don't know where you come from, you don't know your history. If you don't even know your own philosophical beliefs, you don't even know your own methodology then you really are lost. So a lot of people are kind of wandering around in confusion um, and then hassling me about why I use, use the tropical zodiac. I'm like, whatever. I don't, or like, you know, there's these various different like house systems and things like that, which again, I could care less to me. It's sort of like, you know, it's not important. You know, it's like whether you have an Intel chip or AMD chip, I don't worry about that stuff. I need to use the software. You know what I mean? That's again, it. that's the idea that the technique is somehow significant in and of itself. And that there's a best technique for everybody. It's like there's a best paintbrush for painting. Like what? I mean, it, it just you have a preference, perhaps. There's there's techniques that maybe you can use better with your intuition, but there's no objectively better methodology. That's good. And I get that with the traditional. Oh, you have to use this particular, you know, equal whatever it is, whole sign houses or whatever. There's a huge big fad for that and shouting and and I have people call me up on the phone and the first thing they ask me is they say, "Do you use whole sign houses?" And I say, "No," and then they just hang up. On because that's their entire decision because I'm not going to be working with somebody who uses whole sign or people say I'm not I'm comfortable with that that's what I'm I like it resonates with me so therefore I'm going to reject everything you do based upon the fact that it's not using whole sign houses so it's yep. really kind of frustrating but that comes from an attitude again that th the it works itself that's not looking at the intuition the combination of the technique and intuition you know and there's again nothing wrong with whole sign houses if that's the choice you want to make for yourself, but it'd be nice to leave me alone and let me do my own thing without, you know, getting dumped on that. Because that's what I do as a sort of self, you know, preservation in a way is I recognize I need to be tolerant. And I, it doesn't make any sense logically to me to say that I'm right because I'm right for what I do. Right. I'm not a relativist though, either though, because what I would say, there's no right way. There's a couple of sort of right ways and there's an infinite number of wrong ways. You know, and that's where the prediction comes in, because take your methodology, get a question or a, a chart that you don't know the outcome from, make a prediction in writing and analysis and prediction, and then check whether you got it right and do that about 100 times. And then you can see whether or not it's workable, yeah. you know, and that's what I but but again, I wouldn't try to say that only one method works, you know, because, again, there's a heavy intuitional and Vedic works. Like I said, Hellenistic is a good school. You know, these are all workable schools. Modern is good too. And so you just find the one that resonates with you and the one that gives you those accurate results if you want to do predictive astrology. But very few people are doing that. Again, what most people are doing is, like I said, it's after the fact stuff, you know, or made up or whatever. So, so it goes. I want to have you talk about these talismans. And so there's talismans for different planets, planetary talismans. Can you? Talk Every about. celestial factor, like we're saying, has mm -hmm. a has a soul, has a spirit. So potentially anything celestial, and well, anything. We're just happening. Astrological magic basically is decided. We're going to sort of focus on astrological things. We're not doing like earth magic, you know. We're not doing magic of like 
stones or something. We're not doing, you know, we're not doing like Kabbalah, right? So Agrippa has three books of occult philosophy that correspond to the three worlds, the material world, the celestial world, and the divine world. And so these are all potential interfaces. So we're just focusing on celestial. So astrological magic, in my formulation, is a type of ritual and ceremonial magic in the Western tradition, because there's lots of ceremonial magic, you know, the Solomonic grimoires and things like that, that only works with astrological spirits and does so at astrologically appropriate times. So we only interact at a time that's astrologically appropriate for that celestial factor, and we're only dealing with celestial factors, and we're working in the Western esoteric tradition. But you could break that apart. I mean, there's people that do magic. They want to, they do Jupiter invocations, but they just do it whenever they feel like it. They don't time it. There's people that just time things and don't do any invocation. That was very popular in the Renaissance because they didn't want to have any, be accused of working with demons. So they were like natural magic. It works by itself, which fits with the modern view. It's rays. So that's automatic too. It's impersonal. Um, and then you can also do, um, ritual magic and time it without working with rich, with magical you know, with astrological spirits like the goetia are not astrological spirits but they do astrological timing for like pretty basic like you know waning and waxing moon and moon sign things so you can take it all apart but basically that's that's how i you know how i define astrological magic so for example fixed stars if you look up in the sky at night there's stars right they're called fixed because their position doesn't change relative to each other rapidly like planets do there's about a thousand visible fixed stars and they're arranged in 48 constellations traditionally so 12 zodiacal constellations and then 36 extra zodiacal constellations so potentially each one of those fixed stars you could contact as a spirit would have its own thing that it did and you could make a talisman for it but from our traditional sources we have the best one for fixed stars is called hermes on the 15 fixed stars so we have 15 fixed stars that we have a lot of information about. So we have a, an image for the talisman, a picture that you could use for it. You have a sigil, like a little, like a symbol. We have things that it rules, and then we know what it does, what its, what its functions are. So that's enough information that we can contact that spirit, and then we can make a talisman, and we pretty much know what general areas it's going to handle. But, but potentially, it could be a thousand of them. But, you know, my view is that the original information came from direct contact with the spirits, either through dreams or visions or psychic, you know, means. So we're just going to have to wait until we catch up, you know, people starting. Because I, Fomalhaut, which is the a star in the mouth of the Southern Fish constellation, um, is very prominent in my chart. It's conjunct a, a particular planet in my chart. And um, I feel like I had a close connection to it. So I did a divination about whether I could do the talisman of it, and I got a yes. So I went ahead. So the, the talisman I did for Fomalhaut is fish. It's easy. It's fish-based. So it has a sort of fish, you know, image on the talisman, and it has a fish sigil, like sort of fishy-looking sigil. And then it's – but we have an idea of sort of what the effects are from other traditional sources, not from talismanic use, but more predictive. And so – but that seemed to resonate. So – and so, but to me, the real seal of approval was the, the divination. I was really impelled to it, my intuition, and also that got that positive divination for it. So that's the only one I've done in, say, 25 years. But okay. I, So that's what I feel like was we'll have a slow progression of, of modern people in this tradition that'll, that'll start doing that. Whereas I've had people say, oh, well, just willy-nilly contact them. Just like, you know, like the 17 angels of the 72 angels of the, what is it, Shem Ham Forish? I'll just call them all up just for do it. To me, they're less like a judge. I mean, you can talk to a judge if you have a reason for talking to the judge, but you don't just start calling them up willy nilly. And that's what I, you know, I don't feel like the angels are just waiting around to do stuff for me, like servants or something, you know, like, you know, like a customer service line. You know, I think these are super powerful beings that you want to treat respectfully. And if you have a reason for contacting them, fine. But that's the problem. Like we have a lot of fixed stars that we don't really know exactly what they do or, or what the sigil or symbol, or we don't really know what to do with it. So that's the just a practical difficulty in doing that. But I think all celestial factors could, like, for example, we have names for all the, uh, well, like the 28 mansions of the moon. That's another example. So the moon orbits the earth in 27.5 days. And so the Vedic, they have nakshatras. Chris, someone hassled me about this saying, well, there's 27 nakshatras and there's not, there is, there's not. They, they had some big, complicated Vedic astrology thing. But anyhow, more or less, there's 27 Vedic you know, mansions. In the Western and Arabic system, there's 28. 
And so the moon in each of these mansions uh, is, they have a magical use. So they have an image again. Um, they have the name of the Lord of the mansion or lady of the mansion. And they have the use and incense and the things that it does. And so the third mansion I really love. So every month when the moon comes to the third mansion, I do an invocation of the spirit of the third mansion. There's a couple of different names. And um, it's for all good things. So that's it's that's the magical use of it. Those are all those are all as far as I'm concerned angels. But we have all that laid out in nutritional sources. It's quite easy to figure out that information. People are most comfortable with planets, and so this is what, again where it comes into this view of what we're dealing with. If you see the natal chart as sort of a map of energy, and this shows where the planets were at your birth, beaming energy at you. So for example, Saturn was in the seventh house, but he's afflicted. Well, we may be not even afflicted. Saturn's in the seventh house at your birth. Then, oh, Saturn is a love talisman for me. Or if I'm having problems with relationships, it's because Saturn's fault. So I'll, I'll do remediation. I'll stop that energy or I'll fix it. And I can do that. I can easily see what's going on from looking at the chart because the planets are causing everything. They're the direct cause of all the positives and negatives. And it's all individual to me. And so... If Saturn is associated, like I said, with love in my chart, if it predicts it, then Saturn is the problem or Saturn is the solution. And so that's the that's the typical view. Again, I don't I have a different view of it because to me the the when you look at your natal chart, it's like like repertory theater. You have 12 houses, so you have 12 roles, and you have seven actors, and they can all play those roles. And so they step in and give you information. They're messengers. But my view is that the planet like Saturn in the seventh house is not that Saturn is messing you up or beaming energy at you or that you can fix your chart by fixing Saturn somehow. If Saturn is predicting you have love problems, then then my view would be you want to deal with it by a talisman that naturally rules love or naturally has the effect of dealing with love. So Venus. And so that would be my suggestion. Now, if, um, so that, as you can see, that's a different approach. And that's, but it is, if you look at the talismanic stuff, there's no support in any traditional source for saying that Saturn becomes a love talisman because he's in your seventh house. Well, if you look at Saturn, they say Saturn rules these following things. You know, so Saturn rules old men and senators and agriculture and melancholy and occult philosophy and deeper wisdom and things like that. Or Venus is love, pleasure, um, playing stringed instruments, you know, having sex, you know, um, art, beauty, things like that. And and so if you did a Venus talisman then that's the kind of effects that you'd expect from a Venus talisman. Not because, okay, Venus is in the 10th house, so it'll help my career. It's like, that's that's different. I mean, that's not saying it's wrong, but again, the traditional, I'm trying to follow along with the, with the because see, what's weird about it is once you get heavily into the traditional approach, your instinctive reaction tends to follow that. And so I've had that numerous times, had a view about, okay, this particular indication, and I'll find it in a traditional source that follows that. Because I mean, I'm just deeply imbued with that, and I've had the same. It's a bit same thing as a lawyer with a judge. What I do is I try to predict what a judge is going to decide, and I can do that because I've spent 25 or 30 years practicing, and I know how they think about stuff, and so I have the same reaction that they do. Not all the time, but oftentimes, you know. And where it'd be different from somebody who has no idea, who's not doesn't trained in law and hasn't had actual practical experience with judges they're going to be all over the place in terms of predicting how they come out. So that's what I would say about it is that it's, it's a, it's, it's, it's a craft, you know, and that's the same thing with this, um, which isn't to say again, if you want to have that approach that that's wrong or anything like that, it's just that, but it's not, because I don't want to be like, Oh, I, I'm the one who's backed up by the, the sources. So I'm right. And you're wrong. I'm just like, what you want to do is find out what resonates for you, you know, and then follow that approach. But it is a little problematic to have an approach where you don't understand why you come up with things things just yeah. seem automatically true to you and you have no idea why it is and from a practical standpoint you don't want to worry about philosophy but it is it ends it ends up being you're controlled and i'm controlled by mine too i'm not saying i'm independent of it but i try to have a little a higher awareness of what my sources are and what my background is but recognizing that again i'm not free of them i just have weird sort i just have weird you know sources right right so but anyhow with the talismans if you want to make a talisman, you need to find a time that's appropriate for that particular celestial thing. So for a planetary talisman, 
you want to do a time when that planet's energy or whatever influence is strong. So for a planetary talisman, I look at book two, uh, book two, chapter 10 of Picatrix has a bunch of planetary talismans and it lays out a bunch of factors, about, about four, three or four factors. And they're, they kind of change around because it's, it's a traditional source of being consistent. But the, if you look through that, you can see that those factors are basically that the planet be dignified in essential dignity. So essential dignity is based on the sign placement of, of things and where in the sign it is after the lesser dignity. So for a sun talisman, you want to have in the sign it rules, which is Leo, or in its exaltation, which is Aries. So those are the two strongest essential dignity placements for the sun. You then want to have the sun either rising at the, on the eastern horizon, which is at the ascendant, or directly overhead at the midheaven. Those are the two strongest placements for it in terms of placement in the chart. And then you want to have the planetary hour of the planet. And the planetary hours are um, natural in that they start at sunrise and end at sunset for the day. And then they that the, the whole 24-hour day ends at the sunset of the next day. So you can see, though, that they're going to change. I mean, in the, in the summertime, the, the summer hours are going to be long. And the winter hours, I mean, the, they're, the, day, the night are going to be short. In the wintertime, the day is going to be short and the night's going to be long. So you basically need a calculator to figure it out. But each planet has a planetary, you know, during the day, maybe I think there's three. And depending on what time of year it is, it could be short or long period of time. So you, but that's the planetary hour. You can get a calculator to do it. So you have rising or culminating, uh, ex exalted or sign, uh, planetary hour, and then you want it to be unafflicted. Now, exactly what that constitutes on afflicted is going to depend on the individual person. But for example, making and applying square or opposition, those are bad aspects. If it's retrograde, sun's not going to be retrograde, but other planets could be retrograde. That's an affliction. Com combust too close to sun, that's an affliction. So there's just a whole bunch of different possibilities as far as that. Now, there's about 50 different ways to be afflicted. So if you followed every single, like Guido Bonatti list a bunch of them in his, in his aphorisms, if you followed every single, it's in the book, it says it's an affliction, then you're not going to be able to make the talisman. You're going to have to make a judgment about which ones you're going to follow and which ones you're going to not. So for example, I don't worry about Void of Course Moon. Not a major affliction, so I'm not going to worry about it. Um, you know, separating versus applying aspects. And again, in horary astrology or electional astrology, an applying aspect is effective, a separating aspect is ineffective. But that's good for malefic stuff. If you're separating from a malefic, you're separating from a square, it's not a problem. But it, it would be in a natal chart. So again, people know natal and they bring it into this. And the, the, so there's all that sort of stuff that goes on. Also, people are afraid. So, but you need to, what I do is I select these factors in advance. So I have these specific factors that you must have, specific factors that you can't have. Other stuff is a bonus. So I don't worry. It's nice you have a bonus. But don't worry about it. And then I look ahead for elections that fit that. What I get the impression from the modern style is that you just start looking at random charts and whatever pops out at you is how you do an election. And they'll have intuitive stuff, you know? And that's, the, I mean, again, people will look at the, the, the chart of the talisman when I've only looked at those particular factors and they'll start wandering all over the chart of the talisman and they want to treat it like a natal chart. And so they're going to marry the talisman. Except the problem is the talisman doesn't have... Um, like neighbors, it doesn't have a home, it doesn't have children, it doesn't have illnesses, it doesn't have a spouse, it doesn't have uh, secret enemies, it doesn't have a career, and it doesn't have, you know, hopes and dreams. So the chart of a talisman is not like the chart of a person, okay? It's different, at different factors. I mean, it's universal. I mean, everything that happens at that moment, at that time, date, and place has got the same chart, whether it's a death chart, a, a birth chart, a horary chart, chart of a chicken, you know, chart of an, you know, all the stuff's going on at the same time. You have to kind of, and each chart is going to have different things you're going to be looking at. So that's another thing to look at. But um, so if it's a fixed star, you want to have that fixed star rising or culminating and the moon making and applying conjunction sextile or trine and then unafflicted. Those are the factors that I use. And that comes from our traditional sources. There's a book called, like I said, Hermes and the 15 Fixed Stars. And that's what it, again, it's got a lot of stuff in there. If you look at all, if you compare everything, that's the underlying sort of essence of it. Mansion of the moon, mansion of moon would be rising or culminating, and the moon in the proper mansion. So those are all different things that you look at. But then, so those would be the initial making of the talisman at that time. I'm going to have you stop here, and we're going to, because we're over an hour, but we're going to go into the second hour. So come to the mushroomsprentice.com, and, and we're going to continue, because this is absolutely fascinating, and I want you to also get into the effects of these various planets and also of house-based talismans. So we will talk about all of that in the second hour.